on behalf of Xiaolan and Andrea, I would like to apologize for their not being here, but unfortunately COVID has hit both their homes and they will not be here at today's talk. So Tom, Avery and I will uh, be taking care of this and also helping out with questions at the end. And today we're introducing Yong Yen Zheng and she's a professor of applied linguistics in the College of Foreign Languages and Literature in Fudan University in Shanghai, China. So she was a visiting scholar at the University of New South Wales in Australia, a Fulbright visiting scholar at Georgia State University, and was a Tin Kaping visiting scholar at the University of Hong Kong. Her, interest, her research interests include bilingual, multilingual development, academic literacies and language in education planning. Her publications have appeared in several journals and she is now editor of the International Journal Language, Culture and Curriculum, as well as the associate editor of the International Journal System. And her talk today is looking at the perspective of mobility to delineate the challenges and opportunities of multilingualism in Chinese language in education planning. Using her own research, she will address how multilingual language education is intricately connected to mobility and social participation. Her studies will also show how families of different social economic statuses invest very differently in their children's language learning. And we will also hear how the middle class ethnic Korean families in China struggle to maintain their ethnic language after migrating to metropolitan cities. So a big round of applause and a very warm welcome to Young Yen. Thank you, Young Yen. Thank you, thank you, Angie, for a very nice introduction. And um, this is my great honor to be invited to speak at this event of University of Bath. And then um, it's a huge pity that um, I haven't got the opportunity to visit uh, the United Kingdom yet. Uh, I plan to visit the United Kingdom before 2020, but then the pandemic hit everybody. And you know, in Shanghai, we are in lockdown now because we have serious outbreaks in Shanghai right now. But I hope everybody is staying safe and then um, we are um, enjoying our life by sharing research. Now today I'm going to talk about social mobility, multilingualism and language education. So we all agree that we are in a multilingual world. Um, there are three major languages that are being spoken in the world. Mandarin, Chinese Mandarin, English, and then of course, also we have Arabic, Hindi, and Spanish. No one would deny the fact that we are in the multilingual world, but multilingualism is not the latest phenomenon. It has been going on since the emergence of humanities, but multilingualism has, been, has become unprecedented because of the massive social migration and mobility. So nowadays, multilingualism has become an everyday phenomenon that we have to address in almost every aspect of our life. So, um, we will see that this, this is the model proposed by the DFG group back in 2016. I will just start here as a major theoretical perspective that guides, that has guided my research, my series of research. We need to recognize the changing nature of language learning in a multilingual world. For example, language, especially English, has been increasingly commodified. And then uh, we also have new technologies. We have diverse data sources and also networks. For example, nowadays we talk to people online all the time, see, just as the event is taking place on an online platform. And we also have a lot of computer mediated and the digitally mediated communication. Then we have social media and then different, especially young people, the younger generation is displaying their different identities through um, different languages on the social media. Then our social groups and communities have been altered by mobility. We do not have our traditional sense of community. And then um, we also, it's very hard for a person just to be, to be staying in the same place that this person is born. It becomes rare and rare. So we will notice that globalization has heightened 
the awareness of multilingualism and the dichotomy of second and of foreign languages just become dissolved. Especially like look at the uh, mega status of English, the English language. It's difficult to assign the status of English. Is it a second language? Is it a foreign language? Well, probably we have to look at which people or which group of people we're talking about if we are talking about the status of the language. So now um, social mobility, multilingualism, and the language education. There are two kinds of social mobility. If we refer to uh, Professor Suresh Kanagaraja's latest recent, recent publication on the Modern Language Journal, Mobility Migration and the Languages. The first kind, we would say this is the upward mobility. So um, how we try to transmit our social capital and a cultural capital to our later generation in order to achieve upward mobility in this society. This is one kind of mobility. And the other kind of mobility, we call it geographical mobility. So that is to say we migrate from our hometown to the big city, but then this kind of geographical mobility is also connected with upward mobility because we want a better life. We want more opportunities. We want to study abroad, to work abroad in order to get to, to in order to become better selves and to fulfill our own aspirations. So in this sense, mobility in two dimensions, upward mobility and geographical mobility, they are inherently intertwined. But then during these processes, the role of language can never be undermined because sometimes it is the language itself that has enabled this kind of mobility. Then I'm going to use two studies to share the um, how I see the role of language in these two dimensions of mobility, upward mobility and, uh, and the uh, uh, geographical mobility. The first study um, was published on the current issues in language planning, two worlds in one city, a social political perspective on Chinese urban families language planning. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, article, uh, you're welcome to read it. Then families, then th this article, this study is related to the dimension of upward mobility. Families with lower socioeconomic status in Asian context have remained relatively underexplored. So we wanna see how socioeconomic status, SES or social class may intervene the processes and outcomes of language learning. And then we started this study by taking the perspective of family language policy and a family capital. The overarching theoretical, overarching theoretical framework is Spolsky's tripartite model of language policy. We basically look at how language policy is constructed through language practice, language beliefs, and the language management. I believe that our audience is um, quite familiar with Spolsky's tripartite model of language policy. Then the second theoretical perspective is a family capital theory from Coleman. We, disting we distinguished the three types of capital, physical or financial capital, human capital, and a social capital. Economic capital then is not the sole determinant of the quality of children's home literacy environments. That is to say, it is not that you have all the money that you, you're going to invest in your children's language learning journey. It's probably more complex than money itself. And then parents sometimes have to make a decision that this is related to language management. In fact, it's called family language management because parents have to make the decision as to which language they want their child to learn, which language they want their child to speak. Then we also go back to this model to this um, uh, DFG model, because we want to have an ecological perspective on individual families or individual groups of people, their language management. So in family language policy, in the, um, uh, we, we conceptualize FLP, family language policy, in a multi-layered framework. So in the macro level language planning, 
we refer to the language policies at the government level that reflect the societal language ideologies. Then the micro level language planning refers to the family language management decisions within the family domain because the parents make decisions for their children. But we also want to add another dimension here that is the meso level language planning. Then we conceptualize meso level language planning as language learning activities that take place at the community level. So if you still, uh, let's see this, um, this diagram, we will see that individual families are in the core, these language management decisions are inevitably affected by the meso level social cultural institutions and communities, as well as the macro level of ideological structure. Then our research questions are the three are the following three. What were the government policies with regard to early childhood language learning? Were there any language planning activities at the community level? If yes, were there any differences between two SES communities in this respect? And then what were the parents' beliefs about their children's Chinese and English learning? And what measures did they take to support their children's learning? So um, I need to clarify that. Our study was conducted in Shanghai, a metropolitan city, and in most and, and, and in Shanghai, in fact, English is the dominant foreign language. And then also here, the Chinese refers to Putonghua. Then we are using a comparative perspective, a comparative approach. We actually have two communities. One is called a community A. Basically, this is a middle income or middle income community for upper uh, for middle class and upper middle classes in Shanghai. We use housing prices and a demographics to uh, to determine these two communities. For community A, residents mostly purchase their own property with an average price of eight to 10 million RMB for an apartment. So basically in community A for an, an apartment, it's usually um, a 10 million or, or 15 million RMB. For community B is quite large population of migrant workers. Um, migrant workers here refer to people who migrate from rural areas to Shanghai. And then they are us usually doing um, chores they're doing uh, this kind of ding ding TD uh, jobs. And then the, this community represents the lower SES group in Shanghai. They mostly live in rented apartments and the rent is around 1,500 to 3,000 RMB per month. Then we use the family SES questionnaires. Um, it was, I always just consulted the OECD to distribute this family SES questionnaires to the two communities. And actually my student, my co-author um, helped me to collect the data because she has some contacts with the kindergartens. So we went to those kindergartens, asked the kindergarten teacher to send this online questionnaire to the parents, to the parents. So then because we conceptualized the study in three different dimensions, we collected data according to the three dimensions. For a macro level, we collected doc policy documents related to early childhood education, language use, and language education. In the meso level, we did we we actually had multiple visits to the community's public libraries because we want to see whether there are language planning activities or language learning activities in the community public library in the a community A and a community B. In the micro level, we did a questionnaire study um, targeting at parents' self-report language beliefs and also their language practices. So we, um, we approached residents from community A and residents from community B. The questionnaires were distributed online either through the WeChat groups or we collected on-site um, at community A's shopping mall. Now let's look at these um, two different SES groups. We assume that these two groups would be di different and the data also told us that they are vastly different. We calculated the SES score by using, um, the, by using the formula presented by the PISA test. So then the, the mean score 
for community A is 0.9. And then the mean score for community B is minus 0.84. So you will see that these two groups are, the mean score should be the higher, the better, right? So uh, you see community A is like more like the, uh, uh, upper middle class, and then the for community B is more like the lower class. And we can also see that these two communities are vastly different from each other in terms of the degrees, the uh, education level of the parents. For community A, almost 76% of the parents have above college. So they have master and even doctoral degrees. But in community B, less than 1% of the parents have the master's and doctoral degree. Then let's also look at self-reported English proficiency by the parents. You see in community A, most of parents reported like almost the 60% of the parents um, report fair and even 6%. But in community B, these parents, most of parents have zero English proficiency and the nobody reported advanced. So these portraits, just to give you some idea of the differences between these two communities. Now let's look at the three different levels. The first level, early language plan. But the early language macro level, it is in the government policy kindergartens, especially from public kindergartens. It is particularly stated in the government policies that children or public kindergartens are not allowed to teach English to the preschoolers. So you see, this is the public policy. And then we found that, first of all, the language management does not seem to be a primary concern in early childhood education. By browsing and doing the uh, a, a little corpus studies of these policy documents, we basically found nothing as to how to guide the children's language learning. Then the only explicit language policy related to the English is a ban on English teaching in kindergartens. And this change, <clears throat> in fact, contradicts the paramount importance attached to English learning in contemporary Chinese society. Because we know that in contemporary Chinese society, you have to take English almost um, everywhere. You have to pass all different levels of matriculation test. And then the final test, the national matriculation test, you still have to take English. But of course, nowadays we have German, French, or those, that's another side of the story. But still, English is the predominant foreign language. But then interestingly, before six years old, public kindergartens are not allowed to teach English to the children. We see an apparent conflict between the government policy and also the social atmosphere. Now, let's look at the two worlds. Both communities seemed to have sufficient resources to which the resident communities, because in Shanghai, they have pay for each community, they'll have at least one public library. So, but you see the community A library, there's a higher SES community noted disciplinary differences and they arranged activities to foster children's science literacy development. But in communities B, they also have children's book, but those children's books are stacked without any order. And then they're just put there for, for parents to browse or for children to browse. This is for Chinese literacy, but we do not see many differences here. But then the two while the two communities did not differ much in terms of provision of Chinese literacy resources, there was a huge gap in the quantity and the quality of English literacy resources available to the groups. This is the picture taken from community A. If you can see that, this is actually called Oxford 
a tree, Oxford tree, or, or and then an English picture books. And we can see all these books are stacked in good order. And then they are in a, a series of books, English literacy resources. But in community B, we do not find the section to store English literacy resource, English literacy books or English picture books. Basically, they only have how to pass the test or vocabulary books or ABC, um, this kind of primers for it in English. So we see that these two communities are vastly different. Very interestingly, we also have found that the two communities differ distinguishedly in the activities that they are organizing. This, these pictures are taken from community A and English reading activities are organized regularly in communities A's library. And then a community A, they have picture book reading, popular science reading in Chinese, but community B also have picture book reading in Chinese, but not in English. And then in community A, they also organize free English reading activities for preschoolers. Upon closer investigation, we found that this English reading activities are actually organized by a group of volunteers from a neighborhood university, as well as mothers. Chinese mothers are so agentive that they want their children to have this kind of reading atmosphere. They collaborate with volunteer students and with the community library in order to organize this kind of free reading activities. So here from this point, we have already seen the strong parental aid in planning and managing their children's literacy activities. Now let's look at the micro level, at the family level language planning. Our questionnaire findings reveal that the families from the two communities shared equally strong beliefs in favor of English language learning for their children. So basically, regardless of your socioeconomic status, the parents from both communities all believe in the paramount value of English. They all want their children to learn English well because they all believe that English is the language for their children's future. But interestingly, even they share similar aspirations, they differed significantly in their actual language management practices. So let's look at this family language ideologies. We see that in English ideology, there's no difference whatsoever. There are no differences. Children should learn English from very young age. Children must learn English well. Good English skills are of great help. This, so we see that they share similar aspirations. But then let's look at this sentence. It's very interesting here. That is, I can give support to my children's English learning. And there seems to be vastly different. For community A, they have 3.61 um, uh, in a five point Likert scale. In community B, the mean score is only 2.31. These two communities differ, differ significantly. But, uh, sorry, we also see that there are, some, there are some differences even in Chinese learning. So, Parents from community B seem to be less confident to provide literacy resources for their children's Chinese learning, even if Chinese is their native language, their home language. So the lower SES group exhibited a greater degree of attitudinal ambivalence because it's even if they, they want their children to learn English well, they, they are not sure if they want to provide extra language support for their children's Chinese learning. And then parents from the lower SES group tend to have weaker impact beliefs where parents see themselves as more or less capable of and responsible for raising bilingual children. So in this sense, parents in the higher SES communities, they not only have stronger impact beliefs, they also have stronger agency because they're actually doing something to change the situation because the public kindergartens are not allowed to teach English to their children. Those mothers are rolling up their sleeves and say, hey, we're going to teach our children ourselves. You see, so this strong impact beliefs on the part of the parents 
are translated into strong parental agency, especially in terms of mother's agency. And then this is also related to the parental human capital because it is central in shaping the family language ideology and in framing parents' engagement with their children's bilingual learning. So we'll see that even if Chinese parents can have similar aspirations, their own socioeconomic status and their own educational background may um, have deep impact, profound impact on their, um, on their way of managing their children's language learning. So let's recall the huge differences in parents' educational level and English proficiency. It is a little bit different from the families investigated by Professor Lee in Canada, in the Canadian context, because in the Canadian context, it seems that it is not the uh, parents' economic capital, but, um, or, or even human capital, it's because of something else. But here, in our study, we basically see a stri quite straightforward relationship between SES and the parental involvement in their children's literacy planning. And then um, interestingly, when we look at the language management practices, we see differences except frequency of reciting Asian Chinese poems. But then in even in frequency of shared book reading in Chinese, there are significant differences. So it seems that parents from lower SES group are less involved in their, in their children's literacy development. So th this is a um, conclusion from their language managed practices. We see that families from different SES communities engaged in distinctive literacy activities in the home environment. And then also we have found that the use of digital resources was mediated by the parents SES because in our questionnaire for the lower SES families, they say that they don't know where to find English resources, except the fact that there are a lot of free online resources, but those even those online resources are available, lower SES parents are rarely able to make use of them. So that is to say, they are less able to appropriate the affordances from their ecological system. And then it seems that parents from the higher SES group agentively mobilize the family's physical and a social capital to enrich their children's language learning opportunities. And in particular, their language managed practices are extended to the realm of private tutoring a form of education that is strongly mediated by the family's SES. Then basically we see that the lower SES group were less able to mobilize their social cultural capital. And then uh, they are also less able to utilize digital resources. Then um, in, this, in this sense, when there is an absence of government or institutional support, say the government has a ban on English, the community has the laissez-faire attitude, then this kind of lack of support from their meso level and a macro level ecological system, then it may accentuate and even reproduce the hierarchy of social capital in language learning. In this sense, the upward mobility is thwarted for the lower SES communities or for the lower SES groups of families. Now let's look at another study. That is the, the second study is related to physical mobility. Um, this study, okay, live transcription close has been able to, okay. This study is, um, is a study I collaborated with my colleague from the Korean department. She is an ethnic Korean and she has access to the Korean community in Shanghai. The title of this article is Ethnicity is in the Blood, Not in the Language, Exploring Korean Chinese Bilingual Families Multilingual Planning. So we are trying to look at a group of ethnic Korean families in Shanghai. So, Okay, so this, this paper is already online on the Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development. 
let's look at the, a little bit about the background of the study. You see, it, I, I put, I pasted the two pictures here. This is the Korean handbook and then the Korean customs. They're, they're dancing with their Korean um, uh, customary dancing. Korean Chinese is an ethnic group dwelling in Northeast China, bordering the Korean peninsula. So the, the Korean language um, is um, in a quite peculiar status. We call it the cross-border language, or in Chinese, we call it Kwa Jing Yu Yan, because within the border of PRC, the People's Republic of China, it is an ethnic language. But in um, North Korea and South Korea, this, this, they are also their language, but their language is like a foreign language to us. Then Korean Chinese group, this minority group ranking fifth in non-Han Chinese population in Shanghai. So it takes about 1% of the total population in Shanghai. We have more than 20,000 people there. And Korean is their ethnic language. And then this group of people usually they were born in the Korean, um, in the Korean um, autonomous region in the Northeast China. They are raised in Korean and Chinese Mandarin. They are all very successful Korean Chinese bilinguals. Then they moved from their hometown to metropolitan cities. We call it a kind of domestic migration, but why they moved? This is because of the economic ties between China and South Korea. South Korea has a lot of joint venture companies in big cities in China. And then they want to hire those people, Chinese people who can also speak Korean. So then in this sense, their ethnic language capital has enabled this group of people to migrate from their hometown to metropolitan cities. But in China, if you're familiar with the Chinese um, demographics, um, in the big cities, most big cities are located in the uh, coastal line and also in the east part. And then in these cities, the majority are Han nation, not the uh, minority nation, it's Han nation. So this is the basic background. Then we take the theoretical perspective of investment an investment perspective on family language planning. Well, we, this uh, diagram is taken from Darwin and Norton's 2015 model of investment. Then we also looked at how Korean immigrant families in some Anglophone contexts um, keep to maintain their Korean language, their heritage language. For example, Song in 2010 found that Korean immigrants in the US contested the naturalized language ideology of Korean as a solitary national identity, and instead regarding it as a marketable commodity in the US context. So in, in this study, these Korean parents and Korean children, they do not think that Korean is a solid, solitary national identity, but they think this is something that they can capitalize in order to, 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 um, to obtain some economic gains in the US context. Then if we are not, if we are going beyond the Korean community, we look at Konagaraja's 2013 study of Sri Lanka Tamil families in three Anglophone countries. His study also showed that some first generation parents did not view Tamil as essential in maintaining one's ethnic or a cultural identity, as long as other cultural practices were maintained within the family. And the Costa Cabral is a more recent study. Uh, she studied East Timorese migrant parents, language management decisions uh, in Northern Ireland. And then she found that Timorese is linked to place or origin and cultural practices rather than specific language resources. So I give you these three studies to, um, because we want to say that, in fact, in our traditional thinking, one nation, one ethnic language, and one ethnic identity. But it seems that this kind of one-on-one um, -on -one relationship becomes contested especially in our increasingly fluid multilingual world. These three studies have foreshadowed that some migrant families or immigrant parents may not see their ethnic language as essential in maintaining their ethnic identity. Let's see our study. So the study is guided by two research questions. 
What languages do Korean Chinese bilingual parents in Shanghai choose to invest in for their children? And then the second research question is, how are the parents' family language management decisions mediated by their identity, language ideologies, and a family capital deployment? Then uh, this is the mix, again, this is the mixed method study. We distributed questionnaire survey to 30 families, to 30 fam uh, Korean bilingual families. And all these families are successful Korean bilinguals. Korean Chinese bilinguals, and they have similar backgrounds. They all got the college degree. They all work in Shanghai. And then uh, we also picked up six participant families to conduct qualitative semi-structured interviews, as well as home visits to these six participant families. Oh, um, sorry, probably this is a little bit blurry. We cannot see much. These are the information um, for the six families. Now, first of all, let's look at Korean and Chinese in the family's present life. Then all these parents, although they have pretty good job and they have their, um, uh, their college de degrees, they still lack confidence in both Chinese and English. And then the parents said, we weren't able to compete with others due to our limited Chinese and a zero English background. And here, this limited Chinese refers to Chinese Mandarin, Chinese Putonghua. And then they constantly feel that they're not native, native speakers of Mandarin, so they cannot compete with their colleagues. They also have mixed identity. One of the mothers said, I was becoming more like a Han Chinese woman. And then when saying that, She's not happy because her mother actually scolded her saying that you're becoming more like a Han Chinese woman because you becomes rude and impolite. So um, they, they, they seem, it seems that they have been living in Shanghai for such a long time. They're, they're constructing some, a somewhat mixed identity. But their biggest concern is that there are no Korean environment whatsoever. So all, all the cartoons the child enjoys and all the games he plays are in Chinese. They also want their children to maintain Korean, but then they feel helpless and powerless. They attribute it to the lack of a Korean environment. Then the academic pressure is another thing. They say that the competition in Shanghai is insane. One of the mothers said that his, her child has to get up at 5.30 in the morning and they take a bus to the school. It takes one hour to get to the school and then the children get off school at five o'clock in the afternoon. So there's no time for the mother to send the child to other, to, to uh, there's no time to spend on the child's Korean learning. And uh, we asked, is that possible to send their, your child to the Korean Sunday schools? They sometimes send their children to Korean Sunday schools, but still they're complaining about the lack of time. And then they say the language shift is inevitable. So the parents said, even if he can speak a little, his children definitely won't be able to. So what's the point of trying to maintain the Korean language? Then they also try to construct a Korean identity, but not through language. Despite being successful bilingual themselves, only 6.7% of the families uh, did not use Korean at all. And 90 reported using Korean only 10% or 20% of the time at home. So they failed to transform their own linguistic capital into their children's Korean learning. We need to recall that all the parents are very successful Korean Chinese bilinguals. And even between themselves, they speak Korean. Between themselves and their grandparents, they speak Korean, but their children do not speak Korean. Maintaining cultural heritage, they also try to, maintaining, uh, try to maintain cultural heritage through cultural practices. They wear handbook to school ceremony. They tell stories to their children about the origin of the Korean people. They even, they hang a photograph of the whole family wearing handbook in the living room. So this is a standard family practice, which indexed their pronounced ethnic Korean identity because we see that during our home visits to, their, to, to these families. We see, that, so we see this family portrait hanging on the wall to say that this is a Korean family. But, 
And then、uh, we asked some questions. If your kid can't speak Korean, do you think that would make her less Korean? And then Mrs. Park said, "We can't impose an ethnic identity on the kid. Whether she can speak Korean or not, we have been having miso soup and kimchi at home since she was born. These food habits won't change, and she will always be Korean." So we see that language, or or the use of language, ethnic language, is severed from the construction of an ethnic identity. But the food, and then uh, um, the the food habit is ingrained, deeply entrenched. And Mr. Moon said, "Ethnicity is all about the family blood. It has nothing to do with the language." We actually took the quotation from Mr. Moon to entitle to 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 design the title of our paper. Ethnicity is in the blood, not in the language. Then English. Has become a very important language planning decision for these families. This is an investment to their children's future. The parents are keenly aware of the linguistic hierarchy. Mrs. Park said, "You need to be able to speak English to get a job in companies like Samsung in South Korea, and it won't matter if you can speak Korean. Rich families in South Korea will send their kids to the U.S. or Canada. Those less well off to the Philippines." It's the same here in Shanghai. Korean adds no competitive edge. So this quotation stands in sharp contrast to Song's、uh, previously mentioned Song's study in the United States, because in the United States, Korean immigrant families regard Korean as a competitive edge. They see it as a commodified language. But here in the chi- in China, in a non-Anglophone country. English obviously has greater, much greater value than Korean. So that makes that makes Mrs. Park said Korean adds no competitive edge. And then they also perceive benefits of learning English. What do you want your child kid to be in the future? Mr. Yoon said, "We have little choice but work in industry after graduating from university. But he will have far more choices to be a civil servant, a university professor, a banker, and more." And then there is one sentence I didn't put here. Another parent said, "I want my child to study abroad, and then English is a must." So basically, English is considered an investment to the children's future. So, con- in and to to wrap up the study, it seems that similar to some first generation Sri Lanka Tamil families in Kanagaraja study. Who did not view Tamil as essential in maintaining one's ethnic or cultural identity? The Korean Chinese parents in this study also tended to believe that sharing the same cultural background and cultural customs was a primary symbol of belonging to the ethnic community, whereas speaking and understanding the heritage language ability was not so important. But do they really not care? Well, it seems that. This is the result of their negotiation with structural constraints. When we ask these parents, "Do you really do you do you want your children to speak Korean?" They all say, "Yes, we do want our children to speak Korean, but we can do nothing about it because of the academic pressure, because of the linguistic hierarchy in the in their present life, because of their life, their dissatisfaction that they have encountered in their current life due to the lack of English abilities. They want a better life for their children. So parental aspirations then are related to the imagined identities for their children. The real they they have crafted an identity for their children as. Real urban residents speaking standard Chinese, global citizens speaking global English, and Korean descendants who may not speak Korean but who maintain cultural ties by observing cultural customs. We have found this kind of identity or imagined identities that these parents have crafted for their children. So, in this sense, identities are. Mediated by powerful language ideologies, these languages are playing a crucial role in the parents'、um, language management decisions. Now, let's go back to our、uh, my diagram of social mobility. So, it, it seems that upward mobility and this geographical mobility are depending on a lot of factors. 
the human and the cultural cap capital. If we, you want to achieve upward mobility, um, we, we know that human and cultural capital play a role here. But the role of language here is also essential because it is a negotiation. Most of the parents' decisions are a result of the negotiation with structural constraints. What if in Shanghai, for example, we put Korean as important ethnic language and it, what if um, the children can have some extra points when they take national matriculation test if they can speak an ethnic language, you see? So if there is some institutional support in this sense, then probably the parents are more motivated to invest in their children's ethnic language maintenance. What if we have a community of Korean speakers so that, or not only Korean speakers, of course, but also uh, other ethnic language speakers, then if we have more community support and institutional support, instead of having a less fair attitude towards language management, the parents probably will find more support or they probably will um, exercise their collective agency. In fact, my colleague and I are uh, conducting another study in the um, ethnic autonomous region in the Korean ethnic autonomous region in Northeast uh, China. In their ethnic autonomous region, the children all speak Korean Chinese, Korean and the Chinese Putonghua, and the children are also learning English quite well. So we looked at that. We see how trilingual development is maintained, including the heritage language, of course, and then the standard Putonghua and also English. How is it possible in this autonomous region? And we noticed that because they're living together with their grandparents. With the grandparents become an essential um, agent in maintaining their heritage language. But what if, what if the grandparents can also migrate to Shanghai and speak a Korean language with their children? Then this probably would help to maintain the heritage language. So we try to look at how community and the collective agency has been exercised in, um, in helping or facilitating children's Korean, Chinese, English trilingual development in those autonomous regions. This is the, uh, the, the project that we are currently carrying out. I hope that in the future, we can also uh, publish some results of that project. And then um, of course, the neoliberal discourse of English language learning. So English, we can see that this kind of neoliberal discourse is permeating almost everywhere. Um, the two communities, the, the community A and the community B, both parents believe in the paramount instrumental value. It seems that you master English, you get a better job, you become better self. This is a very new, neoliberal. And in the uh, Korean Chinese families, they also believe in that. So we can see that from this part, the neoliberal ideology of English language learning and English language is permeating almost everywhere in the Chinese society. So that's all for my sharing. And then these are some references selected. And you're welcome to, um, to download those articles from the two journals. And uh, I also have uploaded the, in my research gate. If you're interested, you can also visit my research gate profile. Okay. Oh, this is a little um, um, advertisement. Okay. Uh, Fudan University has a very good relationship with the University of Hamburg and uh, Macquarie University in Australia. And we have, uh, um, uh, we have formed a next generation literacies group. And then um, now we are um, recruiting people, uh, the Next Generation Literacy Network launches international mentoring program. And then um, if you're interested, you're welcome to check University of Hamburg uh, and also Language on the Move website to see that um, uh, we, we are actually have this mentoring group. We are talking about social participation, social justice and uh, linguistic diversity. This is the uh, uh, international collaborative project, okay. All right, so uh, that's all for my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you uh, very much. That was absolutely fascinating, Jung Yen. It's incredible just to think of the social mobility and the impact it has not only on languages in the home, but also within the school. 
So I, I think that everyone would agree that that was a very, very interesting talk. Um, we're going to open up the floor now for questions, if anyone has any questions. Um, so for questions, you can either choose to put your question into the chat box or else you can just turn on your microphone and ask a question. Now, may I please ask that you maybe use your little yellow hand just in case there are several people who have questions. OK, so we'll open up the floor now to you all for questions, of which I'm sure there will be many. Barbara has a question there, I think. OK. Uh, Barbara, just you can ask your question. That's no problem. Hi, thank you very much indeed. Um, that was uh, such a wide ranging um, coverage and, and uh, you touched on so many points, but bringing fresh angles to them. Um, what I um, what I wanted to ask, which I was wondering if you would come around to covering and you, you, you didn't, was the um, relationship with the regional languages of China, because um, uh, studies that we did many years ago in, in, in Britain showed that many children come to school with different varieties of English. Therefore, they haven't got the same linguistic capital when they enter the education system. And I imagine that that must also apply to varieties of Chinese, but you didn't actually touch on that. So I don't know if you have any reflections. Right, right. Thank you very much for this uh, this question. In fact, China is a multi dialectal multi dialectal country. We have nine different dialects, major dialects, and then um, some of the dialects are vastly different from Chinese Mandarin. However, because of the promotion of Putonghua for the past 70 years, um, we see that dialects are in decline. Most of the parent, most of the children do not speak a dialect when they are growing up. Their, the Putonghua is actually their first language. Their parents also speak Putonghua to their children. So in our studies, we do not um, uh, touch upon the dialect part is because my research site is usually in okay we seem to have lost you there young yen i don't know have you slipped out of internet coverage perhaps okay so i think we seem to have lost uh young yen there but I imagine she will be back very shortly. Yeah. I know that there have been a few issues with contact, connecting with the Zoom from China, but hopefully she will be back um, momentarily. Unfortunately, I can't answer the question for her. Well, we um, were, the signal was so strong throughout, so it's only fair at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Hi, I just want to uh, thank you, uh, thank Barbara to bring that question up. Um, it was actually in one of my question domain as well, but um, I'm also from China and I also speak my entire heritage language and Mandarin and English. So um, I, I might be able to sort of probably step in a little to uh, sort of explain the situation there, um, if, if that's all right with everybody. Yeah, I think go, please. Okay, so Barbara was asking about um, our dialects and its relation basically to uh, Mandarin and English. Um, I'm just going to speak from personal experience, and it was also true to reflect on Dr. Jones' uh, idea on declining on dialects, because it's also become sort of a um, phenomenon in China that when families are going to decide which language to teach in to, uh, to their children, they will uh, prioritize Mandarin because it's the official language, it's uh, domestic use nationally, so um, that is the prioritization there. But then also in some area, um, just to be clarify, I'm from Canton area of, of China, which is very close to Hong Kong, and um, we, we speak Cantonese and we still sort of try to maintain our culture and, and our, um, you know, our local culture, our sort of inheritance and our uh, sort of identity when we speak Cantonese. So um, in some family, they will still um, consciously teach their, uh, their children this language in order to try to keep that part of culture. So uh, Barbara, you're absolutely right. There are um, sort of less of a debate, but more of a 
preference over there in, in China now these days in their families to decide um, which language will we be able to um, teach our children. So I hope that probably touched down a little bit on your question there, maybe. Um, uh, if I could just come back, I, I mean, is there also an issue of of, of competence or comfort on the part of, of the older generations in speaking Mandarin Chinese. So it may not just be a matter of inclination to do so. I mean, in Britain, what we find is that families often think they're doing their children a favor by using English and not maintaining their um, uh, heritage language. Um, I'm sorry, I was sorry. suddenly offline and I'm back now. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you. We had actually um, a lovely discussion and I think it was uh, Chen Yueling. It was you speaking just there to Barbara answering the question. Yes, sorry right. yes. to step in. Yes. So thank you very much. So uh, Yong Yen, we had Yueling who stepped in and answered uh, some of the questions, but um, it was Barbara who had asked the question and she was asking. Uh, so that's then where you got cut off, if you'd like to continue. Thank you very much, Yueling. That was very interesting. You're welcome. I'm going to bring it back to you and make myself scared. OK, back to you, Young Yen, if you're ready. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um... So uh, th there's one question in the chat box, ethnic minority, oh, Zhuang, Zhuang language. I've noticed that there is a phenomenon like an accent inferiority. Students from ethnic minority backgrounds sometimes feel awkward about their accent. I'm wondering if there are similar situations in your research context. So we haven't talked about accent in my, our research context, but definitely it exists, this kind of accent inferiority. And I believe, well, look, this is my personal opinions, of course, that it is related to the standard language ideology. And then um, there's another study that uh, we are actually doing. Chinese university students are more tolerant to accented Chinese Putonghua, but they're not tolerant to accented English at all. So that is to say, if you speak Putonghua with a certain accent, that's okay. But if you speak an accented English, that's not okay. So uh, they, they even do not want to communicate with you if you speak with a certain accent. So uh, this is um, very also very interesting phenomena here. Um, but I'm not actually doing a very uh, social linguistic study because I believe that this is related to the uh, social linguistic accent study. But I suggest you look at standard ideolo language ideology as well as um, how people perceive this kind of standard language accent. This is obviously related to the linguistic hierarchy again in the Chinese society. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have a question here from uh, Gielio, and she is wondering whether any data related to other Chinese minority groups in China emerged. And in our study, of course, we only look at the Korean, uh, the Korean families. But um, if you look at the uh, special issue published on the uh, current issues of language planning, um, they, there is also several other studies addressing um, the uh, some other uh, ethnic minority ethnic minority regions. So uh, for me, because this is totally restricted, my 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 own research is actually confined to my own research site because we do not have access to the ethnic community. If not for my colleague, Korean department colleague, I even wouldn't be able to access the Korean community. You know, so um, I think this also largely confined my own research perspective in this sense. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions for Yong Yen? before our time finishes? Um, yes, I actually got one last question mm -hmm. for Dr. Zheng. Uh, first, I want to express how exciting I am with this talk and because I'm basically doing the same area. I'm from University of Strathclyde and I'm doing um, very young English learners, uh, English learning in their early childhood. So um, I was very excited to see you bring up that topic about the ban. Uh, for children to learn English under an age of six. So yes, I thank you very much there. Um, and I just want to further add on that questions that um, 
what do you think? I, I understand that's not exactly on, on your fields, but I think it might be a good extension to possibly ask for your um, ideas. So um, basically, what do you think the impact of uh, the new policy that came out last July, Shuangjian, is going to mm. bring to Chinese children's language learning in general, especially with the former ban for early young language learners? Um, personally, I don't agree with this double reduction. <laughs> I'm a mother, <laughs> and then uh, I'm deeply affected by this policy, in fact. <laughs> so um, th that is to say the children are not allowed to go to those private tutoring schools. And we also need to know that private tutoring is part of shadow education. You know, mm -hmm. So the shadow education exists because mm -hmm. the public education has some deficiencies. Mm -hmm. That's that's something that shadow education has to has to complete or supplement at least. So mm -hmm. if you have this kind of one cut policy, then all the burdens fall on the parents. As exactly. far as I am concerned, no parents would stop. You know, mm -hmm. so yes. then um, we, 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 we the parents are exercising their own parental agency in mm -hmm. facilitating their own their children's own language learning in various ways. And then mm -hmm. it might be interesting to look at those personal stories, those family mm -hmm. stories, and then how, like, for example, parents step up to become teachers of other children's teacher. And then mm -hmm. um, sometimes they have this, this is not for money, of course, they try mm -hmm. to have, they, they try to organize this kind of small seminars online so that children can still continue to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I don't know. I think the policy itself is targeting at some big profit making companies. But mm -hmm. because of this one cut policy is affecting almost every family in the country, then mm -hmm. different families would respond quite differently. And their way of responses, again, are determined by their family and human capital. Mm -hmm. I totally believe that. So then, uh, for example, Absolutely. around around my friend, uh, among my friends, nobody gives up. But I know that mm -hmm. some friends, like um, uh, some other parents with lower socioeconomic status and then uh, with, with a lower educational level, they basically say, okay, we will just uh, give up. We are not going to do anything. So we are just to go for it. The, uh, the government policy. So that's mm -hmm. the reason why I'm thinking that when there is an absence of institutional support or government support and this kind of either a ban or a less fair attitude, then mm -hmm. all the burden falls on the parents, all the burden falls on the families. And sometimes it may even accentuate and reproduce the, uh, the uh, injustice or inequality in education realm. This is my mm -hmm. personal opinions. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Wow, very interesting questions, I imagine this. Shadow education could also be argued the other way that by not having the shadow educator providers that it's taking away from some of the injustice felt by his lower social economic families who could never afford them in the first place and maybe put them on more of a level playing field. But that's, that's right. Yeah, that's that. That's right. This is the other side of the argument. But mm -hmm. actually, I got into contact with some lower income families. They complain about it. They say that nowadays, all those very expensive private tutoring is available because before that, the shadow education is more like a popularized and it becomes cheaper. If you do not have much money, you can send your children to the cheap shadow education institutions. If you have a lot of money, you can, you can hire a private tutor. But nowadays, they don't have the choice of sending their children to the cheap tutoring classes it seems that then they cannot do anything about their children. And then this is against their impact beliefs. This is mm -hmm. against their own beliefs that their children need to have a better future. So this is, I don't know how, how this policy is going to go on. And then uh, let's just look at that. Let's just see. And then this gives the policy makers and also researchers a very good opportunity to look at the, uh, the whole language education dynamics. Absolutely. Watch this space, I think. OK, um, Young Yen, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I don't think there are any other questions there. And I also believe we are out of time. 
So I would again just like to apologize on behalf of Xiaolan and um, Andrea that they can't be here today. And we really would like to express our thanks again to Yongyan for that incredibly insightful and informative talk. I know that there was a lot of excitement on uh, waiting for it because of the, the, the different topics that you touched on that are so important to so many of us, whether it be the social mobility or the language or the injustices within the school system. So thank you very much for that. So I think a big round of applause, a big virtual round of applause for the wonderful talk. And uh, thank you very, very kindly for all that, for all that you have given us today. And thank you everyone for coming along and the video will be uploaded onto our CREA website. And you can also find more information on previous talks, upcoming talks and different information topics that we also have on the website. So we also encourage you to go there and have a look at that. Thank you everybody and wishing you a wonderful day and week and weekend.